All right. So welcome to weighing in on your numbers. We invited past clients and also some current prospective clients that are looking for houses. Uh, glad to have everybody on. So I have had a lot of experience with budgeting over the years um, personally. So, you know, I help people get into debt and I also am passionate about helping them get out of it. So this is just a light um, overview with some tactics that you might or might not be doing. There might be some things you can add to what you're currently doing. Please use the chat uh, or the question button. I'm happy to answer questions. You can also contact me on the side. Um, we can get on a call and I'm happy to, to answer anything you've got. My email is also at the bottom of the screen as well. So before I get started, I wanted to mention that I do have a big YouTube library. I've been building it for a couple of years. So Loan with Jen, I've got two channels. Loan with Jen is the buyer portal where I've got lots of info about just little micro topics as, as far as mortgage goes. And then I've got a more of a biz tips channel just for business people and things about time management and commitment to learning. You see kind of a couple titles there. So feel free to go out to YouTube, um, subscribe, check out a couple videos, pass it to a friend. I'm just passionate about getting the info out there. Actually, I'll be posting this uh, weighing in on your numbers one on the, on the loan with Jen. So that'll, that'll be, uh, popped there after we, after we get done. So just a couple of fancy facts. Did you know, uh, 54% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck? I thought that was just a really interesting number. 50% of the workforce doesn't have any pension. So after they retire, they're not, you know, potentially other than Social Security might not have money coming in. 20% of America, Americans don't have anything for retirement. So I got all this online, um, did some research. Um, when Social Security was first created, you know, back in the, gosh, I think it was the 50s, average life expectancy was 62 years. And now, as of 2020, it's 72 years. So people are living longer. 62% of Americans retire on less than 48,000 a year. And what percent of Americans always or sometimes worry about their money? 60. So that's a big, uh, that's a big number. Okay. So saving a hundred, just a couple of quick stats. If you save a hundred dollars a month consistently, average return of 8%. So I mean, you'd have to put it in the market somewhere outside of just a savings account. 20 years is 58,000. Look at the 45 years. So for, you know, younger people, if you've got grandkids or kids, or you are young yourself, 45 years of just putting a hundred dollars away every single month, half a million dollars. So that's pretty cool. If you save 500 a month, look at that 20 year number is almost $300,000. So for those of you that have a head start. 45 years to go, $2,637,000. I was just like alarmed at those numbers when I, when I checked them out. I thought that was some interesting facts. Okay, some key steps to weighing in on your numbers. First, you have to kind of know what your goals are. So I talk to a lot of people about their money. Um, actually, when I'm talking to them about mortgages, the first thing I say is, do you know what your budget is. Like, do you know monthly what you want to spend towards a housing payment? And I'd say 50% of the people just say, I don't have any idea. Like, I don't know. They know what they pay for rent now, but they don't really know what their survival number is. So that goes by making a plan. We're going to talk about survival number a little bit later in the presentation. So vision, know where you want to go. Like, know, you know, how many years until I'm going to retire? How much money do I want to have? in the bank. There's all kinds of stuff online that you could probably have access to. I've got a sheet, actually, if you want to contact me on the side, that's something that you can plan out. Like, how much do I need to retire? So um, if you do want that, just you could even just pop a note in the chat and I'm happy to happy to get it to you on the side. Um, how to do it, you know, put it in some structure. That's a little bit of what I'm showing you today is you know, we're not going to just wake up and go, oh, I've got an extra, you know, $2,000 in my bank account. I'm just going to go put it in a trade or whatever. No, like the way that I've been able to save 20% or more every year for the last 12 years that I've been focusing on it 
is through structure, um, just having mechanisms to be able to do that. And then of course, making the plan, scheduling things out. Okay. So life is a game. Not everybody plays, but structure is going to give you that success. So um, structure and everything. That's what I do with the team at the office. And that's what I do with my money. It's what I'm doing at my house. You know, when you've got your bedtime routine with the kids, I mean, just think about it. We all have you know, kids on a sleeping structure and kids on a homework structure and, and it does work. So we want to do the same with your money. So it's proven, um, that, well, there's three ways to accumulate wealth. 10% of us inherit 10% of us invest and accumulate wealth that way. And 10% or 80% is through accumulation. So you don't have to be a smart and savvy Warren Buffett to, to make it and accumulate just the repetitive over and over again. And the time is now to start never too late to start. So an ideal balance for you um, of like when you're thinking of percentages. So if you think of what your gross is, okay, some of you are unlimited income and some of you are not, we've got a lot of clients that are on either commission or bonus. So, you know, I would probably count on what's really consistent, you know, if it's commissioner bonus, I would kind of take the more conservative numbers before you, when you're doing the planning. So ideally, okay, 20% of your gross to savings, 10% to giving or charity, you know, some are more passionate than others about that. Um, I personally uh, am in this kind of the 7% number. I gave away um, 7% last year. Uh, 30% taxes. Again, this is going to depend on what tax bracket you're in. It depends on who's in the administration. So this is kind of a moving target that you might need to adjust your bills number in the future, again, depending on taxes. So um, bills approximately, let's say in this model, if this is what your taxes percent was, um, 40% bills living on 40% of what you gross would be ideal. Okay. Uh, so I've got some tactics. I've got six tactics that I've come up with of, of ways that I have used personally over the years to save the 20%. Now I was not always saving. So, uh, I grew up just kind of, you eat what you kill. If I needed more money, I went and worked another shift at the restaurant. So I started working when I was really young. I paid my way through through school, what college 100% back when you could still do that. Uh, it's, it's not possible these days with the cost of education. But back then, if I wanted something, I just went out and worked another shift and got the money and did a, did a double at the restaurant or whatever. And no one had really taught me how to save. My parents weren't savers. Uh, and so I just, you know, they just didn't know how to teach me. So I later in my life, after some painful mistakes, it wasn't until my thirties when I just, you know, I was already married. I had a new baby and I pretty much bottomed out and I had six figure, uh, six figure, uh, credit card debt. So I had to come up with a plan to get rid of it all. And I did, and it took me about a year, but I methodically paid it off. And uh, I've never had, never paid credit card interest since not one day in the last 12 years. So I only spend what I can pay off monthly. Okay. So these are some tactics that I use. Well, I, I use all of these tactics, but so that's what I'm here to show you today. So tracking is the number one thing you will, you will get what you focus on for sure. So if you're not tracking or looking at your money now, I suggest that you start. It's never too late to start. So my suggestion is that you kind of have three main money accounts. We do see some clients that have a lot of different accounts. I just really, I'm of the proponent that simpler is better. I have one account where all of my deposits are, uh, my mine and my husband's deposits are in this one account. And that's where, you know, our bills we, we have everything on auto debit, okay? Because we don't want to pay things late. But the operating account is that checking account. So the money that we save or the money that um, actually, sorry, we, a second account is where I, I say, okay, this is how much we need for cash for, you know, the cleaning lady and the groceries and the different things that we might pay cash with. 
we send to a side secondary account. And that's the account that we have the ATM in. Because I don't know, <laughs> you don't want to have an ATM card. I don't, I don't think you should have an ATM card to the one where all your main deposits are coming in. That's kind of your operating bill account. Okay. I just kind of deplete that out with what's coming in and out based on the bills that we have. Um, and then there's a third account that's just a simple money market account. It's super simple. And that's, I, I accumulate to that until there's three times our survival number. And now I'm going to talk about survival number on the next uh, slide. But um, so if your bills per month and all your spending is, let's say $3,000 a month, then 9,000 would be that account. So when you reach that, that's when you go to other, other things that we'll talk about in a couple of uh, slides. So part of the tracking and what I consider simplifying and what I did 12 years ago was I got to a point and it took a little bit of work, okay? But I got to a point where I just sit down to pay my bills once a month. You can ask cre credit card creditors to change your due dates. You know how some, some credit cards are due like on the 9th and all these weird dates. I'm like, why can't everybody just be the 31st? Like be normal, but it doesn't work that way. So you can change to where certain things come out based on, you know, are you paid on the 1st, the 15th? Some of you are paid twice a month, some four times a month. Like everybody's a little bit different. But so I got ahead of my bills so that I can just sit down once a month and I can and I can reconcile and pay the bills. Okay, um, I accumulate checks. Like I get little miscellaneous refund checks for things. We get some oil and gas royalties. We get a little check. Those things, the the physical checks that that come in, I just accumulate them. I actually put them in a Ziploc bag so they don't you know go away, and I kind of hang them on this little board. And we just go to the bank once a month to just deposit them all at one time. I just it's just easy. And that's just, that's how I do it. Um, I do use a tracking app. There's lots of good ones out there. I use Mint. You can, you know, there's lots of different ones. If it's working for you, don't change it. But if you're not using anything, uh, Mint doesn't cost any money. You know, there's lots of others. So do some research. Um, I like it because it connects with my accounts and I put all my passwords in and it connects with, you know, my 401k and my checking and my credit cards. And so I can just have a dashboard all in one app and I go one, once a month and you actually, I, I suggest that you do weekly, that you look at your money weekly and see and track where you were spending. And I can, you know, make a time period and look and see the, see the categories that I've done. So, I, you know, even a simple Excel sheet could do, but whatever calls to you to track it, you, I, I would suggest that you do something to track where your money is going. Um, I really pay cash for very little these days just because I want to track where it goes. I put almost everything on the credit card or the debit card, uh, you know, through that little uh, side account that I do if I just little miscellaneous spending money. I mean, I do carry cash just for little things, but I hardly anymore. So it's pretty easy to track if you got an automatic categorizer like Mint or something else um, to do that for you. And then you can really see where you're burning your money. It's easy to do. Um, the next second thing is being debt free. And this actually goes in conjunction. A lot of people ask me with, you know, when they're applying for a mortgage, I, you have a lot of experience in this area and this kind of goes towards being debt free. Now being 100% like using cash for everything can be kind of a nemesis and actually not a great thing because if you don't have any credit at all, there's nothing to, to calculate. There's no nothing to score you on. So I don't suggest that, but definitely don't spend more than you, than you need. Um, and I know that it's, I know things come up and there's just life that happens. But the average credit card rate is 17 to 27%. So back when I had all that credit card debt, oh, I just got to tell you, there were days when I had like $4 in my checking account and I was literally looking at my money daily and I was never late on anything. I made it all. I worked it all out. I paid off the smallest balances first because I just needed to reduce the stress of having so many things to keep track of. So I had an Excel spreadsheet and I knew when everything was due and I was like on it. So, I, I mean, I can say 
really, I'm, I'm just glad that I was able to, to at least keep everything afloat while I concentrated on just chopping away. I didn't even care about the, I didn't care like, oh, this is 0% and this is 20%. I didn't care. I wanted the small ones gone so that I didn't have to worry about them. And that's how I personally chopped it away until they were all gone. Um, now, you know, let's say you get past that, the maximum number of revolving cards just for the health of your credit is one to two. And a revolving card is anything that has a revolving balance that you can charge up and down, like, you know, a department store or gas card or visa. I mean, you don't need all that stuff, y'all. I mean, you just really don't. I know it's tempting and you go to Gap to do, I mean, you know, yeah, it happened to me. I mean, I'm offered all the time, like, oh, open a credit thing and you get 20% off. I know that it's super tempting, but don't do that. Well, don't do it if you're about to buy a house because that's too many uh, credit cards. But if you bought a house and you live there, okay, maybe every once in a while do it, but I pay it in full when it comes. But the ideal number of revolving cards for your credit is one to two maximum and definitely watch the utilization. So eight, uh, 30% or less utilization. So like if your credit card limit is a thousand dollars, don't charge more than 300 in, in a cycle, you know, depending on when your credit card cuts off. So that's the key. So if you're preparing to buy a house in the next year, a great time to focus on that because you need not just one month at 30%, you need like month after month after month showing the credit scoring system. That's how it's, it's, that's how it's tweaked to see that you can walk around town with a credit card in your pocket and not charge on it. That's, that's where the algorithm is the strongest. So um, just a little, little free advice on that, but definitely work towards being debt free um, and, and just carry just for, you know, just for, just because who, like I said, not many people use cash anymore. So, you know, you've got to use something and yeah, everybody wants points and everything else. Just don't let it get out of control. Keep a limit on your card. Like just, you know, if you definitely don't want to spend more than you know, a thousand dollars in a month, make the limit a thousand dollars or make it 750 or, you know, try, you can control it that way. Cause the credit card companies are always wanting to increase your, your, um, you know, your ceiling. So be careful about that. Cause then you'll wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like my, my debt, it's just so high. Right. Um, so a third way to build you know, build this structure that I mentioned in the beginning is the survival number. So um, the survival account is that third bank account that I suggest that you have. And it's one that you really don't touch unless there's an emergency. Um, so if your survival number between all your mandatory and discretionary expenses is 3000 a month, then 9,000 times three would be your survival number. Anything outside of that, I put it in investments. Like I definitely max out my 401k, which we'll talk about in a second. I've got a, you know, investment advisor. If anyone that's watching this needs a recommendation to an investment advisor, I know several, um, just depending on what your goals are. And you listen, not all investment advisors want you to have a gazillion dollars. Like there's many that will will work with you from the beginning when, you know, you have just a small amount to save. That's okay. They'll grow with you. So don't be shy about that. That's why I think a lot of people are hesitant, like, oh my gosh, I don't have that much. So, you know, who's going to help me? There's plenty of people. So I, I do know some. Um, so again, back on the survival number, I suggest that you just, you know, the, again, there's probably stuff online. There's probably a Google doc about it. Just a simple sheet in Excel somewhere that you can write these mandatory expenses. I like, I have to pay the light bill. This is kind of my average bill is this, my average bill is $150 a month. You know, you've got to take averages when you're doing this kind of stuff. I know in the summer months, it kind of, you know, goes up, but just do use your best guess, car payment, mortgage or rent. You know, we've got to have a water bill. We've got trash removal. So it depends what's, what's applicable to you. But I also then, so I have that in my mandatory section and then um, in a discretionary section, that's the stuff that if I had to, 
I would cut my housekeeper, you know, the kids frivolous activities of the trainings and the, you know, kids, whatever it is that they're, you know, baseball lessons at D bat, the, you know, the batting cage, if Pablo does that. So, you know, you just, it just depends, right? We're all different. So I do my survival number on living my lifestyle as it is right now with ex, some extra stuff here and there. We eat out, you know, we might go to the movies every once in a while. So just start there and see like, how much does it cost to like live my life as it is right now without any constraints? You know, I do my Starbucks. I do this, put it all in there. And if you can't think of what it is monthly, think of what you spend weekly and then times it by four, four weeks in a month. So I challenge you to put that all on one document. And if you don't like all that fancy online stuff, break out a piece of white paper, like, like literally get a notepad. Okay. And do it there and add up the numbers. So I want you, I challenge you all to make sure you know what your survival number is. Then if you're not happy with your survival number, because it doesn't allow you to save the money. That's where you have to work backwards, right? Like, okay, this is my survival number. It's more than 40% of my gross. What do I do? Well, that's where you start cutting. It's just as simple as that. I mean, like, I don't even have ESPN anymore. My brother's so mad at me. He's like, I can't believe I'm related to you. You, you don't even have ESPN. I'm like, dude, we barely watch it. I don't need the hundred dollar extra sports package. So I don't get it, you know? So things like that. Like think of what you can live with and what you can live without on that discretionary stuff. Okay. So that's where I started to really pay attention to what do I need? What do I not need? What's frivolous? What can I cut? So every quarter, at least I go through and definitely try to weed out different things, Um, you know, save $50 on my cell phone bill or whatever it is. Okay. We've got to definitely pay attention to that kind of stuff. So just a little bit of tips for you guys there. So the fourth thing, definitely make sure you're maxing out your retirement. So you've got to, you know, get with your, get with a financial advisor or a CPA, you know, the amounts are changing. Now that I'm over 50, my amount has gone up so I can can do more. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but um, anyway, so just every third, I didn't put any amounts on here because it just changes all the time. Um, You know, if you're eligible for Roth IRA, definitely my company legacy matches on 401k up to a certain percent. So definitely make sure like that's free money, y'all. If your company matches, you definitely want to put away for that. So make sure you, you know, all if you have a 401k plan, they have an advisor that manages the plan. Get an appointment, ask questions. You know, what does this mean for me? Um, And then if you're self-employed, have your own business, definitely there's tax savings and having like a set plan, you know, for sure you want to look into something like that. So again, check with financial advisor. I've got some names, you know, my contact info was at the beginning and I'll, I'll put it at the end. I'm happy to make a couple of recommendations. Um, uh, cause I know many, many financial advisors, uh, cause they refer us their clients. So we've got several that we know do a good job. I'm happy to, to put you in that direction. And by the way, The financial advisor, um, you know, they're going to be able to get an automatic deduction. Y'all need to pay yourself first. So do all this budgeting, figure out how much can safely go, like have it go directly from your paycheck to your investment person. Like then it's out and you just cannot spend it. Like pay yourself first instead of after the fact. But in order to do that, obviously you need to pay your bills, right? So if you're not being able to save enough, you've got to really take a hard look at that survival number. Again, I'm going to go back to that and, and say, okay, I got to have a hard talk with myself, my spouse, the wall, the cat. I don't even know, like just, you've got to cut, you've got to live within your means if you're serious about saving money. So saving money takes a commitment. So if you're going to be serious about it, And you don't want to be left behind when you are older and retire or when you want to retire, you've got to take action now, no matter what your age is. Okay. I didn't get my act together till I was, God, I think it was some 50 now. I mean, I was like 39. Like I I didn't even have a clue. I had like no savings. And now I've got lots of savings based on just changing my habits and having 
hard conversations with myself around money. Um, okay, so prepaying your mortgage, I actually have a couple of different ideas about that. I know a lot of people rave about Dave Ramsey. He's a great guy, nothing against Dave, okay? I just, I believe that a mortgage, at, you know, low percentage rates that they are, and now, you know, values are appreciating. So if you do have a mortgage, you might be able to cash out and use some money for something else. I just really believe in, you've got a low mortgage interest. If you're making, you know, seven or 8% in the market and you have a three to 4% mortgage, there's a differential there. There's a three to 4% differential that you could be earning money on your money instead of prepaying your low cost mortgage. So I'm a proponent of just leveraging. I do not prepay my mortgage personally. I put it in investments that are earning me more percentage. I have a financial advisor that, that advises me. So I don't, you know, don't, I'm, I don't want to be a day trader ever. <laughs> we lost money a long time ago thinking we were day traders. I'm like, okay, we can't ever do that again. Um, so, you know, I have secondary be different beliefs than Dave Ramsey about prepaying everything, but depends also how old you are, you know, and now that I'm 50, I can see that I'm going to start changing, you know, how I might think about money, about my, my, the house equity and all that kind of stuff. But again, it depends on your age. So make sure you're talking to someone about that. If you want to prepay without really thinking about it, I consider a biweekly mortgage. Now, Biweekly is where you pay every two weeks. So there's a company that has to administer that for you. So like, you know, when you're when your mortgage is with whatever company, there'll be a company, a secondary third party company you can subscribe to and they take out from your bank account every two weeks. They, they're basically getting ahead and, and then they're they're taking a, a payment and making one extra payment per year, basically on your mortgage. Now, I would do it myself and just take a little bit out of put one twelfth or two twelfths, one sixth of my mortgage extra payment on my mortgage every month and just do it that way. I don't like biweekly. I did it one time. I just didn't like the way it felt. It was just weird. And it charged like $4 every time it took something out of my account. I'm like, I could totally do this on my own. I'm just going to pay a hundred bucks extra on my mortgage auto debit and be done with it. So it's up to you, but that's out there. So paying one extra payment, no matter how you do it, you do it one time a year, or if you do it little by little in chunks over the span of 12 months, it turns a 30-year mortgage into a 22-year mortgage. So without even really thinking about it and just paying a little bit extra, it goes a long way. So consider doing something like that with little itty bitty increments rather than taking these big chunks and paying them towards a low interest rate mortgage. But the value of your house, the main thing I want to hit home is, is if you are renting right now, rent is not appreciate. Well, it's appreciating in price. It's going up, but the value of rent is nothing that you're just, well, you have a place to live. That's about it. But a house is going to appreciate now average, like let's the last two years, we kind of have to erase. It's going to go away eventually, but for right now, appreciation is here to stay. Um, I, I believe it's going to be here actually for years to come, that the market's going to be really tight just based on what I've been reading. So getting in and having, let's just say 5% appreciation. So if, if on a $100,000 house, which you can't really get anymore in Houston, but let's just easy math, 100,000, 5% appreciation is $5,000 a year. So that's just adding on the value. So you're, you know, it's silently accumulating and you're not really realizing it. But when you sell your house later on, you're going to be like, wow, I've got this extra cash that I didn't plan on. This is amazing. So it's just sitting there appreciating for you. And you're going to be able to cash in on that at some point. So owning a home is definitely the way to go to start appreciating uh on, on your equity and some, some hot areas appreciate even faster than that. So it's, it's pretty cool how that happens. Okay. The last thing uh, that I have is investing in the market 
Mutual funds are, of course, the safest. I definitely would get some advice. Um, I mean, even though I work with money every day, I don't really, I'm not savvy in the stock market, but I hang around people that are. And so I kind of get tidbits, little bits and pieces. So I would definitely suggest getting um, help in this area if you are not one of those people who have a lot of extra time to study and read articles and all that kind of stuff. But mutual funds are a safe way to, 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 to invest. Most of the 401k plans have mutual funds. You know, pick a fund that has at least 20 stocks in each fund. Invest every month. I would, you know, like I said, with a financial advisor, you can put money away, say, okay, I want you to take out 200 every single month auto debit from my account or have my paycheck go directly to, you know, this mutual fund or whatever. And then, you know, check out 529 programs for the kids, check out life insurance, check out, check out these things that financial advisors can help you with. I'm just a big proponent. Um, my dad sold life insurance for, well, he's semi-retired, but he, he sold life insurance for years and years. I super believe in it. Um, 529s, I have 529s for both of my kids. There's lots of stuff out there that if you don't inform yourself, you're not going to know about it, but it's, if you get consistent about putting money away y'all even $200 a month i mean we went back go you know remember that slide from the beginning where $100 um, a month consistently over even 35 years was like a couple hundred thousand dollars like it's amazing it doesn't take very much um so that is what i've got um these are just some tips, but the main thing is the structure and getting on a path where you're paying attention to your money. So it doesn't take a bunch of fancy programs. Just know your survival number. That's the main thing, because I think if you don't know where to cut, you're not going to have an excess money. And it's hard. It's hard to cut because you're, you know, living with things the way that you're used to them. And it's like, oh my gosh, I can't get a manicure now for like months and months at a time or whatever it is that you like to spend money on. You might need to go some time without that, but the benefits are very, very great. So looking back on 20 plus percent of savings for 12 years in a row, I can just tell you that the, the, the benefits of that are just the best is yet to come. So do the hard work chat with me on the side, you know, email me or call me on the side. If you want to get a call, I'm happy to answer questions um, about that. Cause I've, I've been there. I've been there with a lot of debt. I've paid it all off and now I've been able to maintain that. So I'm happy to, you know, answer questions for anyone about that at all. 